Marcus and Terry with you today on this wonderful Thursday. Hopefully you can hear us and see us okay. Got a little bit of a late start, but I think we're doing all right. So let's see if it is in fact showing. Yes, it is. Cool. So if you're listening in, if you can hear us okay, type something in the box and let us know. My sound should be good. Terry, you want to say something? Give us a little sound check there. Hello, everybody. Hi, Richard. How you doing? Good to see you again. All right. Cool. Cool deal. And I think our email is sent out. Whenever I get a late start, things are a mess, which is not fun, but we Hi, roll Meg. with it. So cool stuff. All right. Awesome. Good to see you here, Richard, Meg. Uh, today, what we're going to be doing is talking about binge drinking. A lot of people have a lot of questions and issues when it comes to binge drinking. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Terry, but from what I heard when I was trying to get sober, um, binge drinking was kind of almost separate from alcoholism. People thought, oh, I'm just a binge drinker. I just, I just need to quit binging and, and I'll be fine. I don't need to quit entirely. I just need to quit binge drinking and, and life will be okay. Um, is that kind of how you felt or kind of what you heard in the circles as well? Well, working with people and working with uh, people that are self-proclaimed binge drinkers, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people will think that they they don't have alcoholism or or a problem with alcohol because all they do is binge drink. So say they can go the whole week and work and then they uh, binge drink on the weekends or whatever they do. Or mm -hmm. they were they're binge drinkers because they're in college and they study all week. Um, so it it can be a form of it, it can be alcoholism it's just really what the uh, what it does to your life yeah and i think uh, i think also one of the big things to look at it is can you stop um, exactly the definition of an alcoholic is someone who can't stop drinking so whether you're binge drinking or whether you know your grandma and you have like one glass of wine every day if grandma can't stop the glass of wine every day and it's affecting her life then by the definition you'd have an alcohol problem because alcohol is causing a problem in your life, uh, hence alcohol and problem. Um, and I think a lot of people look at it differently in different ways, but the real issue is, is what is it doing? Um, for me, I, my story with drinking, I wouldn't call myself a binge drinker because in my mind, the way that I visualize a binge drinker uh, was that, hey, here's this guy who like goes a week without drinking, and then on the weekends, he just gets hammered and plastered and falls all over like a frat boy, and that's a binge drinker. Uh, for me, I was a round-the-clock drinker. I drank round-the-clock to keep a normal buzz level, um, and then I would binge in times when I got you know, in a jam or something bad happened, or just at night. You know, I, I think for me, binge drinking was more or less the idea of first the man takes the drink, then the uh, drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes a man. And what they mean by that is, you know, once you take the first drink, and this goes back to the basics of alcohol literature, where they talk about um, your defense, you, you have no defense against the first drink, right? When you take that first drink, now you have been altered, and the next time you take a drink, it's probably going to be the drink taking it, because nothing likes more alcohol for an alcoholic than alcohol, right, if that makes sense. Um, so when you look at that, it's like, okay, you take the drink, and then you get a little bit buzzed or get a little bit tipsy, and then you just start drinking, and you have no regard for your ideas of, oh, I was only going to have 10 today or 5 today or whatever, and it's kind of out the window. Was that kind of how it was for you, Terry? Um, absolutely. Yeah, that's I, I would be able to drink and then stop. And Richard says I would uh, drink – I would drink three to five days straight and stop drinking for a month or two. That's a that's definitely binge drinking right there too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. And and what's it doing to your life? Because I think the first exactly. advice or the first um, the first clue, the first indication that you have trouble with alcohol is probably the fact that you're looking up these videos. Um, I think that speaks volumes, right? Because I have people in yes. my family who um, they drink. And they're fine, and they would never think to look up a video. And sometimes they even get a little too drunk um, than they would like to be. But it's not causing issues in their life. They're not having trouble. They don't think they need to quit. Um, and, you know, for them, maybe they don't. I don't know. Maybe there's people uh, who just, you know, once in a while they, they drink, and, and, and that's fine. Um, for me and for what I look at is, like, what is it doing? So if you're able to go 
two months without drinking and then all of a sudden you have like three to five days where you're like blackout crazy uh, drinking like a madman, you want to look at it and be like, okay, well, what is the deal? Because with Richard uh, and with any, any other um, binge drinker, we have to look at that and say, okay, well, what's going on there? Because if you never drank, if drinking was off the table, right? If you were like, I just don't drink anymore. Okay. You'd probably be fine. Like you don't have to have it those, those weekends that you do or those three to five days that you do. Um, and you know, you know how to stop. So if it's causing pro- problems in your life, I would look at it and be like, well, what if I just took that off the table? And I think that's what me and Terry found to be a good solution is once alcohol is off the table, once you're like, hey, I'm an alcoholic, I'm not going to drink anymore, I don't need it, it's not doing any good in my life, and quite frankly, I've probably had enough for like 10 lifetimes, so I think I'm good. (laughs) Uh, But once it's off the table, you know, you're going through the grocery store and it's like, it's off the table. It's not an option of do I want this kind or that kind, it's off the table. When you get home and it's like, okay, well, like I started cooking, I did uh, braised beef in uh, wine and tortellini, and I needed regular wine for it because if you use the regular, the salt kind, it would have been too salty. And I'm sitting there and, you know, the thought goes, hey, one of those would be good, even though it's like a little plastic bottle of wine because I got the cheap kind. Um hey, that might be kind of good. I wonder what it tastes like. Um, and you have that thought. But for me, it's off the table, so I don't have it. And the extra one's still sitting there. And I'm like, I don't care because it's off the table. Um, exactly. And I think the idea of having it off the table is is going to be a game changer. And for someone uh, who's struggling, you know, maybe give yourself a year. Say, hey, you know what? I, I could go a year without drinking. Let's see what it does in my life. Um, and then, and you just you just explained what a, gr- a great part of sobriety is is that the alcohol not just being off the table but it's it's not a positive or a negative it's just it it's just not there it's yeah and that that that's key for my sobriety if I had to fight the cravings and fight the obsessions I wouldn't be sober and I think you probably feel exactly the same way exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it was a big thing. Um, you know, at first it was, oh, I can't have alcohol. I want to, but I can't. Um, that was probably the first three, maybe six months of sobriety was I want to, but I can't. Um, and then I got to the point where I was like, who gives a shit? Like, right. alcohol, no alcohol? I mean, you know, you start to equate it and you start to look at it. And for someone who's doing binge drinking, you know, we got to look at it and be like, well, is it doing good? And I would guess a binge drinker is probably more so able to admit, no, it's not doing good. I go get plastered. It sucks. I throw up um, and I feel like shit. Now, for an everyday drinker, um, I think there's probably a lot more perceived, and I'm going to use the word perceived, benefits um, because, hey, we're getting our daily buzz. We're getting rid of anxiety. We're doing this stuff. Um, so for that, it's a little bit harder to look at like, hey, what's what's the downside? Because I'm like, hey, this helps my anxiety. I need it every day to cope with my anxiety. I need this every day to cope with my daily stress. Um, as to where a binge drinker, it's, it's kind of, and, and maybe I'm wrong because I was not um, just a binge drinker. I did binge, but I never stopped, right? I was like, I never stopped. Um, so we got to look at that. But for me, it's like, hey, it's it's all bad, right? So that would be interesting to see, uh, Richard, if you could type in your thoughts on that. Like, is it easier for you to see, yeah, there's really not a lot of benefits other than I hang out with Joe and Tom and the guys and, you know, we hang out and that's what we do. Uh, maybe that's the benefit. Or, um, or Terry, did you ever have times like that where you were just a binge drinker? Um, well, maybe in college. As okay. far as, uh, yeah, I would sober up and uh, do classes. Of course, I'd party during the week, too. But uh, I don't think I was quite a binge drinker ever as far as what one would normally think one is. Uh, Meg says that she started out or started out a binge weekend drinker and then slowly over time turned to everyday drinker. And that's what I think happens with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Although I've, uh, I've talked to some people that... Uh, they just remain binge drinkers, and the the uh, reason they finally accepted the fact that they were alcoholics or realized that they were alcoholics was just that they were starting to get these negative consequences in their life because of their drinking, 
and they just got worse and worse. Like they would fall downstairs and crack ribs or, or something like that. You know, they just get these consequences or get a DUI or something like that. And um, that's where they realize that alcohol just, uh, it, it's the problem. And for some people, it takes a long time to figure that out. Well, and I think it goes back to what we were talking about yesterday, too, or uh, last week, uh, where we were talking about, like, I, I really believe, and I think scientifically it kind of backs it up, I believe that if you have enough alcohol, you're going to become somewhat dependent. Uh, whether it's a, a, a psychological dependence, whether it's a physiological dependence, I don't know. I don't have any letters after my name, obviously, as it says down in the disclaimer. Um, but I think if you have enough, you're going to get that way. And like men, uh, Meg has found, uh, she says, you know, I binge all the weekend. And then it turned into gradually, um, you know, being a full-blown alcoholic. And that's kind of how, I guess, if I look at my journey, because I, I, I noticed there was a problem in probably 2000. 11 2012 that's when i was like okay there's something wrong um now before that i would go and i'd go to a thanksgiving or something and i'd have way too much uh which would be like a binge and then i'd just have my little you know light beers for the rest of the time um and then i'd have like a bad time again and then you know it'd kind of be off and on um but i think what happened was my tolerance went up so i was still doing those big binges i was just doing them every day because now my body was used to it my mind That's was right. used to it um whereas before you know you go to thanksgiving and you'd have a half a bottle of champagne and you'd be under the table now i was like well i can have a half a bottle of champagne on my own on a regular day and i'm fine um so not necessarily the amount um because the amount went up you know i was like okay well now I'm having enough. And, and I think if you look at uh, Terry and I towards the end of our drinking stint or career or whatever you want to call it, I don't know why they call it a career. I never once got paid for it. Um, <laughs> I'm still waiting for the check from Anheuser-Busch. You know, maybe they'll fund our show or something. You Who helped knows? some people's uh, careers is what you did. <laughs> what was that? You helped people's careers. The yeah, exactly. Liquor business. Yeah. I probably have a wing in the Anheuser-Busch place or whoever funds all the beer or whatever. Um, but yeah, you know, you look at it and towards the end of the drinking career, it was almost like you were binging every day. Uh, the amounts you had were, were kind of the same as a binge drinker. Absolutely. Um, Probably think, more. Oh, go ahead. I Probably I more. Up. I can hardly hear you. Let's see here. That's okay. There we go. Okay, cool. Now I should be able to hear you. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I look at as the cycle of binge drinking is usually you start out and you're like, hey, you know what? I'm doing all right here. Um, I just go out and I binge drink with the guys. And, you know, in the beginning of my drinking, it was like that. I started drinking uh, the first time I ever got drunk. Um, ironically, it was with a family member who is now sober. Um, he had a hard time with stuff and now he's sober and it was great. Uh, but I was 13 years old. I was in Las Vegas and um, where we went to Las Vegas, we got free alcohol. Uh, when you checked in and for people that were like, uh, you know, 13 years old, you're like, hey, check it out. There's a fridge and it has free alcohol. They'll give you free alcohol everywhere in Vegas, but this fridge had it and they also had Coke. So I'd be like, I'm just uh, getting a couple Cokes here. Clink, clink, clink. And then I'd leave with my Coke in my hand and five bottles of Jack in my pocket. Uh, but that was the first time I got drunk. Um, I remember I liked the feeling. Um, I really enjoyed being able to shut off, but I hated being piss drunk. Like, even up until the end of my drinking, I hated being completely drunk, sick, not functioning. Um, so that was kind of where I was at. And then I had another time drinking when I was, like, 16 or so. Uh, my friends and I uh, raided their parents' liquor cabinet, and we didn't know how to make mixed drinks. We thought you poured that much drink and that much tea. Uh, needless to say, that night was very bad. I was feeling like crap all night. Um, and, you know, I was like, whatever. I guess that's what happens when you drink too much. I didn't drink till I was about 20. Um, then I drank off and on at, at, at 20. Um, around 22, 23, I started drinking hard stuff at night when I worked. And once in a while, I'd have a little bit too much. Um, but never anything I thought was a problem. And then slowly, slowly it crept up on me. And I think the common denominator is the fact that I like the way it made me feel. 
I liked that I could shut off. I liked that when I had a lot to do at work, um, because I work for myself, there's no boss, I got to self-motivate. Um, when I had to work, hey, I got my bottle, I got my uh, laptop, we're going to hash it out all night while everyone's asleep, and then, you know, wake up tomorrow. Um, and that was kind of my life. But when I realized it was a problem was when it started causing issues in my life. It was like, hey, you know what? You're not making appointments. You're not making deadlines. You feel like crap. Your body internally, like, I, I don't know if it was this way for you, Terry. Um, but for me, I, I used to wake up every day and I'm like, I, I feel like I'm dying. I yeah. feel like my body is literally eating itself alive because I'm living on alcohol. Um, was it like that for you? Did you get like those warnings of, dude, what the hell's going on? You know? Absolutely. I was 30 pounds heavier than I am now. I had high blood pressure and um, my glucose level was high, which put me at pre-diabetic levels. And um, I felt, but that's just the, the medical stuff. But I felt like crap. I was constantly tired because I wasn't actually sleeping. I was just passing out. Um, yeah, alcohol made me feel terrible. Yeah. And now, hey, I know like when you have a binge and you wake up after a binge, you always feel like shit. And, and that was my thing. Like after a binge in the morning was like, Marcus is motivated to get sober. That's when it, I was like, man, this is it. This is the one. I feel like shit. I'm going to remember this and I'm going to stay sober. But I could never yep. do it. Right. I could never I would always go back. Of course. Um, yep. And I think it's because one, it was never really off the table. Like in if I look at up until the time I really got sober and I was like, this is it. It was never really off the table. It was always like, well, I can have a Bud Light 55. I mean, it's only 55 calories. There can't be that much alcohol. And then you have three Bud Light 55s and you find out that yeah. they taste like water and you really need a real beer. And then when you really need a real beer, you got to have wine to chase. And pretty soon it's this big animal that cre creeps up on you uh, because it's on the table. And I, on the table, I don't mean like, you know, on the table except for like this little bit, right? Because that leaves a little bit and you know how your mind is. I know how my mind is. We're going to be like, hey, this is how it works. Even with non-alcoholic beer. I remember once I told my wife I was going to have non-alcoholic beer. And um, hopefully I don't give anyone ideas. But uh, what I would do is when she was gone, I would fill the non-alcoholic beer bottles with regular. And I was like, hey, it smells the same, tastes the same. <laughs> she has no idea. I haven't uh, read that one. <laughs> yeah. okay. It was it was a tedious task. I mean, yeah. here I am, like, with little funnels and things like that. Um, and it worked for a while till she was like, how many did you have? I only had six. And she's like, why are you on the floor? Well, actually, I had about 30, and they do actually have alcohol in them. Um, and, you know, I'd fill them with other stuff, too. But uh, looking back on that, it's like, hey, that's because I let it be on the table a little bit. You know, and, and, and when you look at your life and you look at whether you're binge drinking, whether you're uh, drinking around the clock, whatever it is, like Coffee Man says, moderate drinking is kind of stupid trying to drink poison and trying not to get poisoned. Exactly. Right now, I'm not saying that normal, everyday drinkers that have their lives under control and have no problem, whatever, to each his own. You know, um, but for me, as an alcoholic, as someone I know in my life could not stop, as someone I know that would like, and, and for you guys, I'm a germaphobe. Big time germaphobe, don't like germs, don't like any of that stuff. And I would literally go through the recycle bin, which is not clean. I mean, come on now. It's like, I don't even think it's better than the trash bin. It's probably the same. And I would get the old yeah. bottles and try to salvage what I had out of them. Now, I was careful to make sure the bottles were closed. I didn't go that far because if they were open, there was no alcohol in them anyway. Um, but I would go through it, and, and that's how I was. And you look at that, and it's like that's – the actions of a man who's addicted that's the actions of a man who can't stop drinking so whether you're binging in college whatever you're doing i'd like you to look at your life and say are these the actions of someone who can't stop are these the actions of someone who is addicted i might not be like marcus i might not be going through the rubbish bin yet but there's things happening in my life alcohol needs to be off the table um, but yeah, does that make sense to you guys? Hope it does. I know we got a lot of questions coming in, so let's, uh, 
let's deal with those as well. You want to take some, Terry? Sure. Uh, Richard did uh, explain his binge drinking a little bit. I would drink to have fun the first night, but when I wake up the next morning, I try to avoid the hangovers, and after a few days later, I can't drink anymore and force myself to stop. Yeah, that was me. Um, towards the end, it wasn't even at the point of forcing myself to stop. I didn't even have a choice. I couldn't stop. But that's uh, that was the beginning of... I guess that was the beginning of where my alcoholism really kicked in was when I realized that I could cure my hangovers by drinking in the morning. And so that's what I do. But then the hangover kicks in at two o'clock and then you drink again and you just keep going. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, right on Richard. That, that's, uh, that is definitely one of the signs of alcoholism. Um, <laughs> Richard, you also said, I hate the taste of the non-alcoholic beer or you hated the taste of non-alcoholic beer. Yeah, and, and like Marcus just mentioned earlier, because we do get comments about non-alcoholic beer here and there, there usually is 0.5% in alcohol in each non-alcoholic beer. So there is alcohol in there. So, Well, and a six-pack is having a beer. Yeah. So a six-pack is like having a regular light beer. Um, and what I found is non-alcoholic beer is not off the table. That's still on the table. It's just a little bit on the table. Um, and I think that what really worked for me, because I tried to get sober for about a year. I went to meetings. I went to church things, um, which if you have church trauma in your life, like I did, don't go to church meetings to try to get sober. Just go to a regular one. Um, just because you don't need that extra element. That'd be like, you know, trying to deal with alcohol because of abuse and going to the person who abused you and asking him to help you get sober. That's, that's silly. Um, not going to work. Um, but, you know, I would go to the meetings and everything, and I, I'd go to them plastered a lot of the time um, or go to the bar right after or lie about a meeting and go to the, the bar instead. Um, but I tried to get sober for about a year, and uh, – I never really was like, hey, this is completely off. I always, in the back of my mind, I always secretly wanted to moderate. I was like, hey, you know what? I, I want to moderate. I want to be able to have like a glass. I wanted to be a normal person that could have one glass of wine or whatever. Um, but letting that little loophole in, it's, you know, it's just not going to work. It's not, it's letting yourself, it's giving yourself an out. Um, and I think for alcoholics, we need to not give ourselves an out. Uh, so for the holidays, if you're worried about binge drinking, remember, if other people have it on the table, that's fine. It's off the table for me um, because I know where it's going to lead. And, and when you think about that, think about what it does bad. Think about the hangover. Think about the, the morning after when you're sitting there stewing about what you did and what you said and who you talked to and who you yelled at and who you're in a fight with and how bad you feel and how you just want to drink more and how um, it's affecting your life, and how, hey, you could have gotten a DUI, right? Um, that kind of stuff will screw up your life real quick. Um, and if not, drinking will certainly screw up your life. So, Absolutely, and you, and you guys can do it. I, for me, I, uh, you know, well, I, I'll bet a good percentage of you guys are going to a Christmas party this weekend, and uh, I'm sure there will be alcohol there. I'm in catering. I have five days straight. Right now, I'm on, on day two of, uh, of Christmas parties I'm catering, and it's just people getting drunk. But I don't have to drink. I'm just cooking for them, and it's, it's fine. It can be I drink soda water or I drink a Diet Coke or whatever, mm -hmm. and um, I just watch them get silly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, you guys can do it. It's, it's not that difficult to stay away from the alcohol. And there's lots of things you can do. Um, I have a person that's also sober that works with me. So that's uh, one of the strongest tricks that I have. But uh, the other one is just having something else to drink. This uh, It can be a dangerous time, these holidays, with uh, parties and then family and family that you may not want to see, family that, that you love to party with or you used to love to party with. And It's a difficult thing. Well, and, let's talk about – oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Go um, ahead. I was going to say let's talk about the major relapse stuff. Uh, there's an acronym in recovery, and it's called HALT. Um, and what it is is are you ha uh, hungry, angry, lonely, 
or tired. Now, during the holidays, if you're anything like me and you have a family anything like mine, you're going to get all of these. Hungry, <laughs> because my family doesn't really know how to cook that good. Angry, because my family talks a lot of shit to each other. Lonely, because sometimes I'm either not with them or I'm with them and I feel lonely anyway because things are different. Uh, tired, because, you know, you're just tired because it's that time of year and you're tired and you eat turkeys and things that make you tired on top of being tired and not sleeping and everything like that. So when you have the hungry, angry, lonely, tired, I want you to remember that that's the time to get your defenses up because you have times when you can be defenseless. And, and I always look at it this way. Um, I look at it as... I don't know what certain situations can do to me. Uh, just last night, I was listening to a book. I listened to audiobooks, um, and for some weird reason, I, I thought it'd be a good idea to go to sleep and listen to a book that is the memoirs of a girl who is in an insane asylum. Right? I, if you guys don't think I'm messed up, and you're like, oh, he falls asleep to memoirs of insane asylums. Okay, we now know he has problems. Um, but I was listening to that, and I was listening to how this lady's life she was like a normal person and a certain situation happened and boom she snapped and it was like whoa okay now she's gone down the road and the whole point of the book was to talk about the failure of american mental health societies and stuff like that um which by the way go to a doctor anyway if you think you have something just because someone has bad experience doesn't mean everyone will um, and you should always go to a doctor anyway and then make your own decision um but i was listening to this and i i was baffled at how a woman who seems like she has things together, maybe a little bit of sprinkling of, of mental stuff here and there, could be brought to like, wow, here I am completely crazy in the nut place or the, the mental ward or whatever. And we look at that and it's like, okay, well, in my life, I know. And something that I submit to all the time is the fact that situations can change me beyond my own recognition. Right, I could go through a situation, like if Terry wanted to be sinister and plotted out a situation and was like, okay, first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this, and we're going to screw with Marcus's bank accounts and credit cards. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to have everyone in his family call and yell at him and tell him he's a loser. Then what we're going to do is everyone on the sobriety channel is going to say how they think he's a fake and a loser and whatever, and he would orchestrate a way to push all my buttons. I guarantee you there are the right combination of buttons that could probably make me drink again. They're probably, I, I, I could sit here and I say, oh, I'm sober. I read all these books. I have a sober, eye. but I don't know. There somewhere in life is the right combination to make us do just about anything. Uh, this was shown in the Sanford or Stanford, one of them, uh, prison experiment. And what they did is they had this prison experiment where some psychology guys got together and they're like, okay, we're going to get, 100 people or whatever into a prison and it's fake there are no prisoners there are no guards it's an act it's a joke it's freaking reality tv before reality tv happened and they take these guys and they take these guys they're like you're the guards you're the prisoners and again remember it was completely fake but after about three days of this everyone forgot it was fake and the guards started beating on the prisoners and there was like riots and crazy stuff and it was something that was supposed to be fake. But what happened was after all this, these people got hungry, angry, lonely, tired. They had their senses worn down and they forgot that it was a fake experiment. And I bring that to show you that that's what happens with us. Sometimes we're going to forget. Sometimes we'll go to Christmas and we'll think, oh, mom said this to me. I'm in war with mom. And it's like, well, who cares? Mom could say whatever she wants. Dad could say whatever he wants. The fact of the matter is, is I'm staying here. Um, and I think in life, oftentimes, we forget, for lack of a better word, that certain things are fake. Like the prison experiment that wore them down and made them do things they never thought. You, you would never say, well, you know, James the accountant, yeah, I think he's going to beat up a fake prisoner. You would never say that. You'd be like, he's an upstanding guy. The dude coaches Little League, and here he is, like, doing crazy things. Um, and I hope that makes sense, and I hope you guys get it, because in our lives, there are things that could wear us down. And, and the key is, is to be on guard and to always, and these are the keys for me. This is what works for me. Always be on guard to say, hey, 
I don't know what can happen. And also, remember, this isn't really real. Right? Like, okay, maybe you got financial difficulties. It's not really real. Finances are just a social accepted thing. Um, you know, maybe you get in a fight with the spouse. For me, I used to think that means divorce or stay, divorce or stay. You can't have a fight without deciding whether to divorce or stay. Uh, and now I look at it and I'm like, I don't need to decide. It's just an argument. Big deal. I'm probably wrong anyway. I'm a guy. We're always wrong. Right? And you Absolutely. have to look at that and say, you know, what can happen? And so I hope that little rambling made sense to you guys. Um, if you have anything to add or maybe make it make sense, if it didn't, that would help. No, oh, yeah, you made a lot of sense there. And, and HALT is one of the uh, important keys for sobriety because it helps build that base. And, you know, the, the actual word HALT, that's another one, which is just kind of you get into a situation, uh, maybe a stressful situation, an argument or something that you're starting to feel uneasy about. HALT. Pause. Relax. Step back. Try to think about what what your part in this situation is and uh, try to fix that. Or maybe you just have to walk away and come back another day or something like that. Um, but that that's, this is a, a, a huge um, tool for me in sobriety is, and especially in early sobriety In early sobriety, I found that I was constantly hungry because, you know, I'd been drinking 2,500 calories of vodka a day. So I had to figure out something to uh, kind of take up that void because I was starving and uh, getting angry. That would that was I didn't wasn't too angry when I first got sober. But, uh, you know, I still get in those situations. And, you know, the, the little things would set me off like um, my wife. Uh, I she said, Terry, are you drinking again? And this was after like six months. That's like. No, why would you ask me that? And it was because where I used to hide the alcohol under the house, I had put something in front of the door. And so she thought I was hiding stuff again. And that made me really angry. But then I had to realize, well, I'm the one that caused her to think that. So it's it's understanding your part in these things. And being lonely, that I was a complete isolator when I drank. I, I didn't want anybody to know I was drinking. So I drove everyone out of my life. And, um, and, uh, you know, Marcus was explaining, you can be, you can be lonely when you're with other people too. Just, you know, maybe they're all drinking and you're not, and you feel left out and, or something like that. And it's, it's, uh, you, you have to, you have to try not to be that way. If it, it, one good tool to use is, is go to a meeting and hang out with other people or, or come talk to us and, uh, other sober people, we can, we can all relate to each other in ways that uh, normal people, <laughs> I guess normal people that are people that are not alcoholics can. And then tired is an obvious one. Um, uh, just I was I was very tired when I first got sober and I just concentrated on uh, if I'm tired, go take a nap or just rest, sit and do nothing. Let my mind rest. So a lot of a lot of changes happen when uh, we get sober. And it takes a while for the body to just kind of stabilize. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think Great too, tool. Um, Go ahead. Remember that, like the Snickers commercials, I like those ones. Uh, my favorite <laughs> yeah. is the ones, I think, it is it James Franco or James something? Um, I know he's the Green Lantern or something in, in one of the <laughs> movies. And he's, he's dressed like Marilyn Monroe and doing the whole skirt up thing. And uh, he's being like a jerk. And he's dressed like her, and he's, like, yelling at everyone. And they're like, hey, man, have a Snickers. And he eats the Snickers and then turns into the regular Marilyn Monroe, all nice and kind. Um, and, you know, it's kind of like that. We're kind of like those Snickers commercials where when you get hungry, you're going to be off kilter. Now, the problem with that is all of these things we have put into our brain. I'm going to draw a brain here. That's a brain. All right? Looks more like a, a one-legged jellyfish. But we're going to pretend it's a brain. <laughs> and uh, what we've done is we have thousands of times reinforced when I'm hungry, drink. This was my go-to. Like, I yeah. didn't have cereal in the morning. Right. I had alcohol, right? Uh, if I couldn't go to lunch or was too lazy to go to lunch or whatever, I'd have alcohol. Um, half the time, I'd go to lunch, order lunch, drink the alcohol, and leave the lunch. Um, so there's thousands of times. I want you to think about right now 
how many times you have reinforced the belief and the feeling, when I'm hungry, alcohol helps. Right? Just think about that in your own mind. For me, at least 10,000. At least. Um, angry. When I'm angry, go drink. I would fight with the spouse. She may as well have handed it to me on the way out. Um, fight with parents, fight with anyone. When I was angry at a customer, a client, um, drinking was the go-to. Thousands of times I said, boom, angry? I don't know why that has that. The comma goes down here. Um, I'm angry. I'm going to go drink. So in your mind, the first thing you're going to think, you're going to feel, and then you're going to think drink, right? And you're not even going to think it audibly. Because the way that the brain works is it takes shortcuts, right? That's how we live. We're like, okay, I know that that red light and this car and that means stop, okay? Um, we don't sit there and think, red light, I better stop. There's a car over here. You're just, er, okay, chill. Um, same thing when you're talking. Oftentimes, you don't even think about what you're going to say because it's already pre-planned in your mind. Your mind is going. It's just going. Um, and the same thing happens here. You could be angry. You could be hungry. And the feeling starts and the craving starts. And you don't even think what you're craving, right? I didn't even care. You could have been like, whatever, this is, you know, uh, shit tasting vodka or whatever. And I'd be like, okay, well, it's got the vodka in it, so I'm good. Um, you know, or it's this or that, or even something you don't like. You're just going to crave that alcohol because you're craving a feeling. You're not craving the drink. And I think it's very important to realize that this is what your brain is doing. So every time you sit there and you say to yourself, a drink would be nice, smells good, tastes good, you're not really craving the taste, right? And you can look at this in life because it's like, okay, when you taste it after not having it for a while, it complete, you have to reacquire the taste, right? Um, and it's interesting to look at because it's like, okay, I'm not really craving the drink, the glass, the smell, the taste. I'm craving the feeling because... Why? Because every time I was angry, I went and got it. And my brain said, ha, huh, shortcut, yay, I love it. Angry, drink, solved. Uh, hungry, I don't have to go have a meal. I don't need to cook. I don't need to get pans out and do dishes. Drink, yay. Lonely, hey, there ain't nothing better for a lonely guy than a bottle of Jack. Right? Not really. But... That's what your brain thinks because it shuts off the feeling of being lon lonely because you sit there and you're like, ah, fuck everyone. They don't know anything anyway. I got all my friends right here in the mirror. And it doesn't really work, but you feel better about it. And this goes through to the idea of feeling better versus being better. Do I want to feel better? Because there, none of these things are solved by alcohol. None of them. Like hungry, you are still malnourished if you drink alcohol. Actually, alcohol depletes vitamins so you're negative negative malnourished angry there ain't a fight that i've had that has been been made better by alcohol they've all been made worse by alcohol. absolutely uh lonely last time i checked if i drank alone on the couch people didn't start knocking on the door being like this is a place to be look at this guy right he's got five day old sweats on and he's all sweaty let's hang out here yeah buddy no one does that um, in fact, it actually pushed family <laughs> members away, right? It actually pushed friends away. They were like, dude, I like talking to you, but I can't hang out if you're already 12 in, right? right. It's not fun. Uh, tired? Well, if you want an endless cycle of never sleeping, keep drinking. So none of these are actually solved. You're just feeling better about them in the moment. And you got to look at that because you're programmed. You have been programmed by alcohol. You've been programmed mentally to think this is going to help, and you've pro been programmed physically because you get that initial thing. Uh, studies have been shown where you take a little lab rat, and you put the lab rat in a little cage, and you give him a little cup of food and a little bell or whatever, and he eats his food, and he's great, whatever, fan, fun, wonderful. Then you take and you introduce morphine or alcohol or some substance <laughs> into that cage. That rat will actually go push the button and get alcohol, and he'll get the feeling, and it'll go boom, zoop, zap, zaps it like a lightning bolt, and it goes, this feels good, right? How many of you guys have had that? You get a drink, and you're like, oh, yeah, th this feels good. It's zapping your brain. Absolutely. Now, the rat is going to go and push the button to get the feeling, neglecting food, neglecting 
family, neglecting well-being. He neglects everything until he dies because he's pushing the button trying to make that feeling. Now, I'd like to think that I'm a way highly evolved creature with my opposable thumbs, but I'm actually not. My brain works the same way. This is why you have drug addicts, and this is my own pet peeve, and this is my vision for our channel and the work that we're doing here with uh, you guys is to change the narrative because for far too long, there hasn't been education, and there hasn't been education about drinking or drugs, and you look at a guy, and you're like, look at that sloppy dude over there freaking does co cocaine until he you know, falls in the gutter and loses everything. What's wrong with him? Well, what's wrong with him is his brain's been hijacked. And it's not like a moral failing, a moral fault. Now, addicts and drinkers will do morally failing things, but only after their brain's been hijacked. So we got to deal with the hijack issue. We got to look at it as something separate, right? Because people, oh, you degenerate drinking fool, right? It's not like that. Your brain's been hijacked. Now, you might do degenerate stuff. That's your own business for you to deal with legally and morally and whatever but let's deal with the hijacked brain issue because the hijacked brain issue is what makes us do crazy things um and to some extent the idea of the prison experiment was a hijacked brain their brain was hijacked boom a switch went they thought it was real the switch is going for you and it says just makes me feel good cool Get in a fight makes me feel good thousands of times reinforced why can't i stop drinking this is why you can't stop drinking because your brain is hijacked and it says i need to drink when i'm hungry it makes me feel better when i'm angry it makes me feel better lonely makes me feel better uh, tired when i get something like uh, how many people how many times in life do you think people have binge drank after losing their job probably happens every day probably like ten thousand times a day um, <laughs> And if they continue and become an alcoholic, it's because they keep doing it. Reinforced feelings and reinforced behaviors and beliefs are going to be the go-to, right? It's going to be the go-to. Like, I guarantee when um, automatic driving cars take over, okay? When automatic driving cars take over and you sit in your car with no steering wheel and no pedals, I guarantee for you guys who have been driving a long time and you get too close to something, you're going to go like this. And you're going to go like that even though there's no pedal and a computer is driving your car. Why? Because it's reinforced. It's automatic. Same with this. Now, you know the car is going to stop itself. You know stomping on the floor ain't going to do nothing because there ain't no brake pedal because a robot's driving your car. But it's going to happen anyway. Same thing with alcohol. So what we have to do is we have to get used to it. As I get used to the self-driving car, I'll relax and I'll be like, okay. Ain't a damn thing I can do. This driving car can drive me into the lake if it wants. Um, so I might as well not do anything because that's how it works. But the same thing with alcohol. You have to train it. These thousands of times you've reinforced it need to be reversed. We have to okay. develop new habits. Yeah. Yes. I'm done with my little rant. So <laughs> let's take You're all questions. good. All right. But no, you're, you're right. You're, you're just explaining that we... Uh, we, we need to develop a new way of life. And uh, we start off by trying to make these things a habit. Uh, trying, to, trying to do the right thing, things for our sobriety every day. And slowly they become part of our life. And we're just trying to make those new channels in the brain, the, the channels that we want to follow so that we don't drink and have that destructive lifestyle. Um, going over to some of the comments, uh, Coffee Man, I'm just scrolling up a little bit here. Uh, when when I drink, I drink until I pass out mostly once a week. I don't mind the hangover, but hate things. I talk when I'm drunk. I'm going to quit three to 12 months, most likely forever, already three weeks in. Good job, Coffee Man, three weeks in. And that's, uh, that's a great way to start. Just uh, see how it goes and um, go from there. Good job. There was a couple others that said, uh, let's see, William G has three months sober tomorrow. The fear of consequences from lapsing, lapsing, uh, relapsing drive me on. So that's good. Congratulations, William. Somebody else had something in there. Uh, uh, was it uh, Matthew had said binge drinking. Great topic. That's what I was. One drink turned into two weeks every single time. So it looks like a lot of people, a lot of the binge drinkers would, would uh, drink for a while and then quit for a while and then back to drinking. 
And a uh, long binge. <laughs> <laughs> my binge was uh, for years and years. So, uh, yeah. But and, uh, uh, Meg, we did add thirsty there for you. I noticed you said it could be for thirsty too. That's, that's sure, cool. absolutely. And yeah. I was a person that uh, didn't like the taste of just plain water, so I always have to have ice yeah. water or so or sparkling water, that sort of thing. But yeah, it's good. Yeah. Uh, dog's coming to see us. Let's see if she wants to come in. She ate up my memory card today, so I got to go buy another memory card today. Nice. Uh, Richard says over 106 days sober. That's awesome. Cool. Good job. Um, right before that, Jay Walker said, uh, never in my life have I had a drink for the taste. And then Richard, uh, I guess you're responding and saying for the effects. Me, I, I like the taste of alcohol. Like to tell the end. Yeah. But uh, really what I, I, it wasn't, I wasn't chasing the taste. I was chasing the effect of the alcohol. Absolutely. But uh, I enjoyed the taste of beer, enjoyed the taste of a martini. Oh, yeah. Oh, and I think that's what the acquired taste is. Right. Um, you know, like, like we crave chocolate. I, I would venture to say it's probably not so much for the chocolate itself. It's probably the feeling because chocolate has something that relaxes you. It has sugar that mellows you out and gets your blood sugar right. Um, so it might not necessarily be that we like the chocolate. It might be that we like the feeling. Um, same kind of thing with like big meals, people who like big meals, like them because a big meal makes you feel better. Um, now that's not saying that taste doesn't matter. I love cooking. Terry loves cooking. He's like a, a chef dude. Um, so to say that taste doesn't matter would be a gross understatement. But I think in some of these things, the like coffee, no one ever likes their first cup of coffee. Never. I never met someone who's like, Ooh, that's good. Unless it's like one of them foofy Starbucks fancy drinks. Um, but no one ever likes the first one until they get the jolt and they're like, wow, this wakes me up. I'm, uh, I'm happy, you know? Um, so I think we should look at that and I think we should really submit to the fact that as much as we want to think we are really in charge of everything and really in control of everything, we're really not. Um, and that's a good book to check out. I think I might have it here. Uh, it's called... Something about the insecurity, living in the age of in insecurity um, by Alan Watts. And he's talking about um, what it's like to really submit to the fact that you don't have control over certain things. Um, because I, I know for myself as an alcoholic, I wanted to control everything. And when I couldn't control everything, I drank. Um, and we got to look at that and say, we really can't control all that much. right? And, and when we submit to that, life is either completely depressing or completely freeing um, and I found it to be freeing because I can't control it I can't make people do what I want them to do as much as I think I can and as, as much as some of the books on my shelf say you can right uh, sales and marketing is always about that but the best you can do in life is ask for someone's cooperation and if you don't get it you don't get it uh, when you go out on your holidays the best you can do is is try to keep cool and ask for cooperation. Right. Well, you know, Mom, I'd really like if you didn't bring that up. I'd really like if you didn't bug me about my alcohol because I'm trying to stop. I'd really like if you didn't do that. And if they don't, hey, that's their bag. Um, it's like my uncle says, you know, everyone else finds something to do. This is what I'm doing. Um, and, you know, focus on what you're doing. What are you doing? This, this Christmas, I'm staying sober. That's what I'm going to do. I know that life will not be better with a hotty toddy eggnog i know that brandy doesn't make the christmas tree bigger and brighter um i know that it really is an illusion and i know that for me to remain sane and not to have the issues i had in the past drinking needs to be off the table and not just kind of off the table but completely off the table um at least until i get to a point where i feel comfortable and even then, like I found now, I thought maybe, you know, I'd get sober and hey, 10 years down the road, five years down the road, maybe we'll start again. But I found that five years, almost five years sober, I don't even want it. I'm not jealous of people who drink anymore. I don't need to have it. I don't crave wine or anything like that. I'm just like, hey, take it or leave it. There it is. I don't care about it. Um, and I think that's a good place to be. And I think it's something good to shoot for is, hey. Maybe you can be there. 
you know, maybe, maybe uh, uh, the guy who's going to try three months or a year, I'd recommend a year because um, it's a full four seasons, go through a lot of stuff in a year. Um, I think if you can get through something for a year, it's really put some, some bearings on it or whatever you call it. Right. Um, because you've done things, you've gotten fights, you've done that. I mean, in a, in one year, do you think you're going to combat these thousands of things? Probably not even close, probably not even close. So what makes you think you'll do it in three months? Um, and you know, to each his own, uh, you do what you think is best for you. But what I would do is I would be like, well, shit, I've reinforced this a lot longer. Um, I think one of the good things to look at too, is maybe say, as long as I've had trouble drinking, I'm going to stay sober. So if you've been drinking for 10 years, try to stay sober for 10 years. You know, you can do it. Um, you just need to learn how, if you've been drinking heavy for three years, say, Hey, I'm going to stay sober for three years. Um, and maybe look at it that way. I don't know. Maybe that'll, that'll help. Um, but during the time you stay, you say you're going to be sober, get it off the table completely, right? Not maybe because maybe it's still reinforcing this stuff. It's still active. Um, and I think that's why people say, you know, addiction is like the three headed dragon or something. And, uh, it's sleeping, it's waiting, right? And it's waiting because all this stuff goes to sleep. Now it's going to go to sleep. Like right now, Terry hasn't drank in, in four years. I haven't drank in four years. Um, right now, this stuff's sleeping. But I know the minute I go and I'm like, I feel hungry, let's have a drink. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, wow. Shit, I remember this. I, I remember that. This is a solution, right? Can't focus? Drink. Whoa, I remember this. Now I'm focused. Um, will I become an alcoholic full-blown again? Who knows? And also, who the fuck wants to find out? Like, I don't. Um, and I don't think Terry does either, and I don't think you guys do either. All right, let's take a couple other questions, and then... Uh, we'll yeah, ahead. Lindsay says, Hi, guys. I find if I make the um, declaration, I'm not drinking anymore, it puts me under stress as my family are big binge drinkers. They just don't get it. Yeah, that's uh, definitely the peer pressure is a tough thing. I mean, there's a couple things you could do. You could step away, try not to uh, um, be around the family when they're drinking. I mean, obviously, you're not going to just not be around your family. But uh, uh, the other thing is, is just not make the declaration. Just don't drink. And maybe they'll ask you about it and say, no, nah, I'm not going to. That, that's what I do. I just say, um, no, thank you. That's <laughs> the easiest way to uh, turn down a drink for me, even when they're trying to pressure me. And I just say, no, thanks. So it's all good. I'm fine right now. Um, you know, I, I like uh, my wife, she's uh, she's she's what we would call a normie. She can drink um, without impunity and she'll have her half glass of wine and uh, she'll and uh, pour out the other half. And that'll be her wine for the night. And, you know, she doesn't she will not drink anything at all and drive. If she has a half a glass of wine, she will not drive. And so when if she goes out and I'm not there to drive, she won't drink. And that's there's a great way to uh, get away from the drink. But that's well, a, that, uh, go ahead. That, that goes to show someone whose mind hasn't been hijacked, too, because right. for me, it was like, OK, I can have four and then drive. And by the way, this is not advice. You should not drink and drive at all. Not even a drop, not even looking at it. Nothing. Don't drink and drive bad. Uh, yeah. But for me, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm cool if I have four over this amount of time and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I never, never stuck to four. Never. Like, to go into a bar with drinking on the table and to say, oh, I'm not going to have one because I have to drive, that's preposterous. That would have been, I mean, because my mind was hijacked. And you could say, well, Marcus was degenerate and he drank and he's alcoholic and he can't hold his liquor. It's, my mind was hijacked. And we got to look at that. Um but yeah, really important. And one thing I will say also, now, this is not doctorly advice. This is probably not good advice health-wise. Um, but one thing that helps me, uh, when I went into rehab, I actually started smoking cigars. And uh, sometimes I'll have a pipe or a cigar. And I found that during holidays, and you could smoke or not smoke, or you could find an excuse or whatever. During the holidays, in the beginning, it was very easy to go out and have a cigar because that was like, okay, these things are going on. I need to go be away from everything for a minute. 
Um, and it gave me an excuse to go outside. So, you know, whatever you want to do, you could just light one up and hold it far away and be like, yeah, I'm smoking or whatever. Um, or just make an excuse to go outside. Hey, I need fresh air. It's really, really stuffy in here. I haven't been feeling all that great. I'm going to go walk outside. Um, giving yourself, I think what I'm saying is not so much the smoking thing, but give yourself space. Um, give yourself space to go check something. Give yourself space. Maybe use your phone as an excuse. Oh, oh got to take this. It's work. Go outside for a minute. Um, you know, whatever. And you could just go out and play poker on your phone. That's what I do. Um, but, you know, look at it that way where it's like, hey, give yourself space. Give yourself plenty of time to not be in the thick of things because the more you're in the thick of things, the more you're in there, um, the more issues you're going to have and the harder it's going to be. Okay. All right, let's take a couple others here. By the way, I love Jay Walker's name. I don't know if that's like his full name or whatever, but I think it's kind of funny for an alcohol channel to have a guy called Jay Walker. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So, Jay says, after crying while drinking a beer because my body needed it for withdrawal and then fi finally recovering and for my mind to still think a drink was a good idea, I became more self-aware. Um, yeah. <laughs> Right. That's uh, that's what I would do is uh, I'd uh, I'd need the alcohol for withdrawal. And um, that, that that was what what kept my alcohol. One of the things that kept my alcoholism going. I mean, I kept on trying to chase that that feeling that I had. But um, after I quit, I realized it, I, I didn't realize when I was drinking that that's what I was doing. But uh, after I quit, I realized that's what I was doing. I was trying to chase this feeling. Um, broken coffee pot. Hey guys, I'm currently on day seven of a binge after three weeks sober. I can't seem to stop now, though all I desire is to stop. It's 9, 12 a.m. and I've already had a shot. I don't know where to start. Well, um, broken coffee pot. I don't know where you are in, in, in the addiction or non-addiction or what, but um, if you're desperate, uh, you got to get to a doctor. That's probably the best thing to do. You can also, uh, since you're on a computer, you can Google. Uh, you can Google uh, um, alcohol help hotlines, and they can help get you and point you in the right direction. But we can't really give you, tell you exactly what to do on here. We don't know you, and we're not doctors. But, but I would definitely start with some professional advice. Absolutely. And yeah, sorry. And and also. Uh... I would say definitely go to the doctor for um, the amount because when you're binge drinking, it's almost like your body's like elastic, right? And you have the rubber band and you're like, stretch it and then it goes back, stretch it and it goes back and stretch it and goes back. And what happens is you're having a bunch, which is like totally screwing up your system and then it goes back and then you're having a bunch and then it's going back. Um, and that's a very dangerous thing. A lot of people think because alcohol is widely accepted in society that it's not dangerous. Right. And it is. It is absolutely dangerous. And detox um, can be deadly. Um, detox can be very dangerous. It can mess with your body, your mind um, and all kinds of things. Um, I know for me, I ended up suicidal and in a mental hospital. So for people that are uh, I love when we went to rehab and it's like, oh, you just do alcohol. It's like, uh, yeah, I do. And it's bad. Um, so not one is worse than the other, uh, but I think in terms of detox, alcohol is definitely one of the worst because it can cause death. Um, and you got to get to a doctor. You got to go and say, hey, dude, this is what's going on. Be honest. I have 15 every night, and sometimes I get sober, and then I have 15. I get, tell him what's going on. Uh, that way he knows what to give you or what to do um, so that you don't have seizures and you don't have issues and everything like that. Um, so go to the doctors first, and then second, is educate the heck out of yourself. Educate yourself on what's going on. Listen to talks, read stuff, go to meetings, um, understand things. If you gotta check yourself into a rehab, do it. Uh, I thought it was gonna be like a crazy, terrible, humiliating experience. I actually enjoyed it. And I didn't go to one of those where it's like, you know, everyone gets a pink puppy, right? This was kind of a, you know, it's like the rehab for normal folks, not the one for Beverly Hills folks. Um, and I still found it to be a very enlightening experience. Um, so that could be an option as well. Uh, but if you don't know how to stop, 
First thing to do, go to the doctor, get your detox plan. Second thing to do is do education. Um, get a buddy, get someone you know that, that you could go to and be like, hey, I'm trying to stop. Uh, this is why in AA stuff, I don't know a whole lot about it because I never did the sponsor route, uh, but a lot of people have a sponsor. And they're like, this is dude call. Feel like drinking? Hey, bud, boom. Um, and I can see why that would be very, very helpful and very good. Um, and, you know, Terry, I think, did you do sponsor stuff? Uh, yeah, absolutely. But if I was to go out and start drinking, I probably would not call him or I wouldn't call anybody else. I mean, I'm just being honest. I, True. Yeah. If I started drinking, I would just completely isolate and turn off the world. Call him when you're ready to get sober again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's probably how I would be as well. That's that's usually what happens. But uh, the, the key is, is to get the tools so that you don't take that first drink and you don't start drinking. It's a difficult situation. You're in broken cuff, but uh, you can do it. And it's just a matter of making that decision to get that help. Yeah. And there you go. That's that's what you need to do. Yeah. Uh, Green River says, I took LSD once and I stopped drinking. Um, well, Green River, I took LSD and I didn't stop drinking. So <laughs> I don't know what the LSD has to do with stopping drinking, but uh, it's just another uh, chemical that uh, I don't know if it's addictive or not. I have no idea, but I don't do I don't put anything into my body like that. So yeah, anymore. Uh, yeah, same here. Um, and I think what he might be referring to is the school of thought in the '60s. Um, the whole idea with Timothy Leary and, and some of the other guys was to enlighten the world with LSD because a few people had an enlightening experience <laughs> and they wanted to get everyone else to have it. Um, and, you know, whether that was what was doing it or not, I think the conclusion that all of those people have now come to is that you don't need it, that you can have an enlightening experience a lot of different ways. Uh, me personally, I've never taken it. I'm scared to death to take it because... Have you ever seen someone make it? Have you ever seen someone make it? You don't want to take it. I mean, just you know, <laughs> um, very bad. Uh, and it's dangerous, too. Um, anything that alters your mind is dangerous because you're not functioning in and of your own mind. Um, so I would look at that. Um, but if you're looking for some kind of enlightening stuff, what I would do is I would look into reading. I would look into not drinking. First of all, just don't drink. Um, and then read and understand, and I find that you will probably get, like the people in the beginning um, thought. Now, I know in the beginning of alcohol literature, they were very spiritual on the side of biblical Christianity, um, and that was the spiritual enlightenment. But I think what they were talking about is a spiritual enlightenment that would enlighten you to things spiritual. Not necessarily, I'm spiritually enlightened, now I need to go read the Bible, but more so, like, I'm aware that there's more going on. I'm aware that I'm not just feel shit, drink, feel shit, drink, feel shit. I'm not functioning solely based on feeling. I'm out there and I'm like, okay, I'm now enlightened to things more spiritual, not things just of the body. And I hope that made sense. But I think that's what um, really works there. And Richard's mentioning that they, they have studies that show, uh, I know you meant to write LSD, stopped alcohol abuse. Um, for me, I'm not going to. I'm not going to replace a drug with a drug, uh, what, no matter what the studies say. And um, I, I do know people that have tried, uh, well, I don't know anybody that's tried LSD to quit drinking, but I, but they've done other drugs that aren't mind-altering, uh, like the uh, antabuse and stuff like that. And I know people that kept drinking with it. It's really a matter of uh, what Marcus is talking about here and uh, educating yourself and getting a way of life that's... Uh, without alcohol and changing your uh, your mindset is uh, that's that's what's worked for me i think also what we have to look at is where it comes from with you because you right. are prone to addiction I right I, I know like i read the books and I, I read the studies that you guys have read and they're like wow this guy was a total ass and now he's happy and great and i'm like well i know a lot of people who were total asses and they took that and they're still complete asses so, you know, um, I think it's something internal, um, whatever it is, and I would look for whatever that is internal. And I'll, I'll leave you guys with a story. There's a story that Ram Dass talks about. And if you guys haven't read Ram Dass or listened to Ram Dass and you're interested in this topic, listen to it. And he's talking about he goes to his guru in India 
And this dude's like this old man. And now my personal belief about a guru is this. You go to a guru and you're like, guru, I'm so stressed about my job and my credit cards and my wife and my kids. And I'm stressed about this. And he sits there and he laughs in your face because he has no idea how Western culture works. And you go, holy shit, this guy doesn't give two rips about everything I'm going through. And that's the enlightenment experience, right? It's like, he doesn't give a shit. People don't give a shit. And um, Ram Dass is talking about his guru, and, and his guru is like, oh, I want to try this medicine that you have, speaking of what you guys are talking about, um, that you guys have, and I'm going to try it. And he tries it, and it does nothing to him. And he's like, what the hell's the point? It might as well have eaten water. Um, and the idea is, is that that's not what it's coming from. That's not where you're getting it. Where you're getting it is from within you. And if you look at that and you say, wow, I can sit here in and of myself and I could take all my problems seriously. I can take all this stuff that has been preconditioned in Western culture or wherever you live and I could take it seriously like those people in the prison experiment. Or I could be like, you know what? It doesn't really matter all that much in the grand scheme of things. What matters is myself, my health, the people I love. And what I do on earth, good. Right? That, that's what really matters. And we can look at it and we could look for enlightenment at the top of a mountain. Or we could be like, enlightening is really deconditioning. It's deconditioning from society. We have been conditioned to think that certain things matter. The fact that it's difficult to stop drinking is because we've been conditioned to think pretty girls and alcohol, uh, successful men and little hotty toddy cups and alcohol and uh, this and alcohol and that and this and success equals Rolls Royce and Mercedes and this and these are the things we've been preconditioned to and when you let all that go that's when you have a spiritual awakening and you say wow it doesn't matter I'm literally a programmed being and now that I realize that I can be free right once you realize that once you're like oh all my desires, all the things I ever wanted mean nothing. It doesn't even matter. Everything I attain to, it's great if I get it. Like, I'm not saying goals are bad. I'm not saying achieving things is bad. I'm not saying the Rolls Royces and the Mercedes are bad. To each his own, right? I'd rather, like, feed people in other countries. But if you want to drive a $500,000 car, that's totally cool with me. Um, but we got to look at that and say, this is what's going on. I have been programmed. And now I'm waking, I'm waking up. And I'm seeing that life isn't just about my little circle. Life isn't something that happens to me. Life is something that is happening, and I'm part of it. I'm one eight billionth of life that's happening on this earth. I'm one of eight billion people on the planet. I'm no more important than them. I'm no less important than them. I am exactly one eight billionth, whatever that would look like as a fraction. I don't even want to try to figure that out. But that's what it's about. It's about, like, what, what does it matter if... A family member yells at me at Christmas. Does it mean I have to go drink? No, it doesn't mean anything. It means he probably would have yelled at someone else if I wasn't there. Because that's what he does. People that yell, yell. People who worry, worry. If you have a problem with worrying, you look at it. And like Alan Watts says, uh, you could find anything to worry about if you're the worrying type. So it's not necessarily that you have a lot to worry about. It's that you're the type of person that's prone to worry. You're going to think about drinking if you're the type that drinks a lot. That's what's going to happen. It's the way your mind works. And we have to look at this and we have to submit and say, this is where I am right now, is where I am. I've lived 39 years of my life and I'm at this moment. And all the stuff that brought me here, that formed my thoughts, all the stuff that made me feel the way I feel is now here. And now I could say, oh, this is terrible, whatever. Or I could just be like, this is where we are. It is what it is. This is where we're at. Sure, sometimes I'll be prone to that. Sometimes I'll be prone to this. Sometimes I'll fail. Sometimes I'll have this. But this is where I'm at. Where do I go from here? Right? And we could look at it that way. Um, and I think there was another guy who spoke of uh, enlightenment and spiritual awakening. And he's like, what is it like? And the guy was like, well, it's exactly like normal life, but you're two inches off the ground. And I love that expression because it's like, you're going to have struggles. You're going to have the same fears. You're going to have the same thoughts and everything. But you're going to be two feet, two inches off the ground. You're going to be like you're in that prison experiment we talked about earlier. 
but you're gonna you're not gonna fall for the shit. You're not gonna think it's real. You'll be like, guys, 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 stop fighting. This is a stupid experiment. Look, the doctor's right. You could see him right over there. That's not a prison doctor. That's some like weird psychology guy who somehow convinced the government to fund this experiment because he's a whack job. It's all fake, right? Um, and that's the two inches off the ground. So I'm full of rambling and rants today. I hope it helps someone. But yeah. All right. Jay Walker, you said, I am the only alcoholic who tried to lose beer pong on purpose. <laughs> and you know, Jay, no, you're not. <laughs> we... Uh, the game when I was in college was quarters, and uh, yeah, I'd lose on purpose, or I'd make the quarter in the beer and and make myself drink. And come on, that's that's I think pretty much most alcoholics are that way. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> all right. So, any last minute questions? We'll take a couple more for like five minutes, then we'll. Uh... Let you guys go about your way. If you guys have any questions, go to TalkSober.com. Uh, fill out the form. There's a little name and email form. That way you get notified when we're live. You get new videos, other stuff we come out with. If you guys um, want to help support what we're doing, there's a button on the bottom of TalkSober.com. You can click it. It is less than 2 or maybe like $2.10 a day or something if you do the math. Help support what we're doing, and in addition, you guys get like some private stuff, some uh, PDFs, and some audio recordings, and things like that. Um, so if you guys want to do that, you can. You can cancel whenever you want. It's not like we're locking you in for life. You just click a button, and it cancels it. So pretty cool. Um, but yeah. Okay, Jay Walker has one more. He says, does that jail experiment symbolic of reality in society? No, it was actually a real experiment. Um, you can actually look it up. There was a documentary made about it. Um, I would not recommend the documentary to the faint of heart because it's kind of difficult to watch. Uh, but it's called The Sanford Prison Experiment. It was actually done in the 70s. Um, but yes, in my bringing it up, it is about the roles we are playing. Um, and, you know, we're buying our role. Like, I'm Marcus, the, the tough guy or the weak guy or the, the damaged one. Or I uh, was abused or I was this or I have to make this money or I'm successful. And what's an I'm, right? Who am I? And we have to look at that and say, um, I can either, either look at my life and be who I am. Like, I think this way. Or I could be like, thinking is what my mind does. Right? I could be the observer and I could watch myself think. Um, and that's the difference. Like, if you're in the prison experiment and you're buying the, the, the stuff and you're like, yeah, I'm in it and we're really here. Um, that's like, being the thinker. You're like, I am the thinker. Or you could step back and be like, huh, yeah, of course my brain wants a beer. It had a beer every time it was sad, and now I'm sad, and obviously it wants a beer. Doesn't mean I'm some weakling. Doesn't mean anything. It just means, you know, you, you plug this wire in here, and you plug it in there, and in the old days, if you remember those telephones, and you get Aunt Mary. Or if you plug it here and here, you're going to get Dad. If you plug it here and here, you're going to get Terry. And that's how the phone worked. That's what's happened in your mind. You plug it here, and then you plug it to alcohol. When this one gets in, it's going to go, Bew! let's go to alcohol. doesn't mean anything, right? It just means that you drank a lot. That's all it means, you know? So, yeah. All right. Any last-minute thoughts there, Terry? Um, well, just binge drinking. You know, if you're thinking, if you think you're a binge drinker or you are a binge drinker and you're just wondering if you uh, – or an alcoholic because you binge drink. I mean, look at look at what it's doing to your life. Are you having negative consequences because of the drinking and the fact that you're here? Maybe it's something you need to look at. And uh, just be honest with yourself. Be willing to figure out what's going on and, and try and figure it out. Take a look at it. And thank you, everybody. We really appreciate your comments. And uh, leave us some more comments after we're done here. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. All right, guys. Awesome stuff. Um, if you guys have any ideas for topics that you want us to cover in our next talks, um, put them on one of the videos. Uh, I do try to read all the comments we get. So if you guys are like, hey, I really want a video on how to deal with Aunt Sally at Christmas. I might not know who Aunt Sally is, but I'll do a video about 
how to deal with your aunt on Christmas <laughs> or whatever. Um, and we'll go from there. But yeah, give us some ideas of what you want us to cover, what struggles you struggle with. Check out TalkSober.com, put your name and email in, get some of the letters, um, and be on our email list. And then uh, help support us, click the button, and uh, you could join our monthly deal there and get some extra stuff, um, MP3s, PDFs, everything like that. And let's all stay sober together through this holiday and through many years because life is way better when you don't drink. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody.